Good afternoon everyone, I'm FPS Chasley and welcome back to my tutorial series. Today we're covering the Oliver Hazard Parry. Or this we're going to start covering the Oliver Hazard Parry. This isn't going to be like the uh, coolest Seawolf Kilo video where I can just like tell you about the differences. This thing is set up completely different. Uh, as you can see we have 12 stations now instead of 9 if you include the nav map, if you include like this view, the nav map view. Uh, pretty much nothing is really the same except for electronic warfare and TMA is the same in principle, but everything else is pretty much set up differently and behaves differently, so today we're just going to be doing um, the navigation station, and uh, if we have enough time left, I'm going to go ahead and do like the equivalent of the sail bridge, which is called the machine gun on the Oliver Hazard Perry, so let's get to the uh, let's get to navigation here. What are they officially called? Probably just the bridge. Yeah, it's called the bridge. Alright, so this is the default screen when you get into the bridge here. you got your course wheel. Uh, auxiliary power units, I'll go over that shortly here. Uh, you got a little speed stack, and of course like your rudder changes. So what you can do with these auxiliary power units, let me stop here. I'm going to stop and make sure my ship comes to a stop, and then uh, I'll go over the APUs here. Alright, we're down to one knot, good enough. Alright, so these APUs are meant to be used at five knots or below, and uh, you use them for getting into port or getting out of port if you're trying to get into a slip with uh, some little like tight maneuvering. So they're probably, you know, like up around here, the APUs, so like in addition, in addition to rudder and propeller, you can use this to make your ship more maneuverable, so you can swing it around a lot more quickly. So you're never really, you're never really going to be using these things outside of like leaving a dock or entering a dock. They're, they're yeah, I'm, I'm just going to show you how to work them though, just, just so you, uh, you know how to, how they work, because they're not too terribly intuitive at first, so you're going to lower both these APUs here. And they lower. I'm not sure if they actually show up out here. They probably don't. Let's see. Let's zoom in. Um, yeah, I don't see them out here. That's fine. Alright, so the APU. Uh, the first time I did this, I thought intuitively you'd uh, think where this is pointing is where the APU would apply thrust. So what I mean by that is that if you have it at 0, 0, 0, and this is, these are relative bearings, by the way. If you have it at 0, 0, 0, you think... Um, it would apply thrust in that direction, which would push the ship in the opposite direction. But the way these actually work is you point them in the direction you want to go. So let's go ahead and energize these things right here, and let's point it to the west. And then maybe here we'll be able... or west relative to our ship, so really just pointing it to the port. So uh, if I go ahead and speed up some time here, you might see that you're... you might be able to see that we're kind of rotating to the left here. If you can see that, you see the horizon back here moving. There's nothing really to, to counter to really show it. Um, I guess you might be able to kind of see it here, but yeah, you, I mean you should be able to see that the the it's rotating back here. So yeah, we're we're turning slightly here as the well you can see it in our bearing. Yeah, just look at my course the whole time. Yeah, so we're rotating to the to port. So then if you go ahead and uh, do this, we'll start going forward here and we'll get it up to maybe you know three or four knots or something, if that. But yeah, we'll get a little bit of decent speed here. What direction am I pointing? Am I going to crash into something? I don't know. I should stop. <laughs> Alright, uh, but yeah, that's the APUs there. So uh, we'll just get those back in. And uh, let's go to the left here. There's uh, multiple stations here at the bridge. Multiple things to check out. So uh, if you come to the left here, you get... Uh, this is like your helicopter stuff. You get the wind envelope. Uh, so this display right here, what this shows is where um, this little red thing can be for you to be able to conduct flight ops. So uh, what that mean? What this red thing is, is it shows the relative direction and speed of the wind. So right now, we do not have the proper wind envelope for helicopter flight ops, so the helicopter will not be able to take off right now. Um, you have this bigger outline here. This is where flight ops can occur in the day, and then this smaller one is where flight ops can occur at night. So you have these concentric rings coming out from the center, and these are five knot uh, rings here. So each ring you go out, the wind speed increases by that amount. So you got five knots, ten knots, fifteen knots, twenty knots, etc. And if you count all the rings, you find out that the maximum wind speed in daytime you can have is uh, forty-five knots for the helo to be able to take off. So what I'm going to do here is let's go back to this direction. Right to One, let's four, go all ahead two, two thirds here, right, sir. just to expedite two, this up a little bit, and we'll just speed up time here. So as you can see, our thing is coming back into the, the into the wind envelope. So for different directions here, your, your your helo can only take off at, at at such a high speed. You know, this first one here is five knots, and you got ten knots, fifteen knots, twenty-five knots here. So 
if this thing is not inside this wind envelope, the helo will not be able to take off. So that's basically all that's telling you right there. And then red deck and green deck, there really isn't a definitive checklist. Uh, but basically, um, it's just something you can set. So if you've got the right wind speed and your pitch and roll aren't too ridiculous, then you can set green deck here. Set green deck. Uh, if your roll exceeds you know, plus or minus 10 degrees, or if your pitch exceeds plus or minus 5 degrees, the helo won't be able to take off either. So if you're in really rough seas, the helo won't be able to take off. Um, you come out to here, and this is on the, the starboard side as well. you got these little like winglet things here where you can kind of just like look around. It's on the bridge, and then you got got uh, binoculars that you can just check out to, relative bearing also. Uh, something else that the, uh, the OHP has, Oliver Hazard Perry OHP for short or FFG7, or FIG7, as some people call it. Um, there's a there's a lookout guy on the bridge who automatically like is able to see things. If, if there's a visual contact nearby, he'll automatically classify them. You can't really do that. so um, it's, it's kind of annoying that you can't do it sometimes, because sometimes you'd be able to see it quicker than he can. There's like a little bit of randomness to it, but he does a pretty good job of picking stuff out. So yeah, you got ordered course, ordered speed... Um, RPM and pitch. Okay, so this doesn't really come into play now, but the thing with the Oliver Hazard Perry is that the prop can always be spinning at like the same RPM just about, but what it does is it changes the pitch of the blade to move more volume of water, create a higher pressure gradient so the ship can go faster. And what this does is this kind of defeats TPK. Um, I'm not sure if they actually model that in this game, that's how it's supposed to work. So like you can go from 10 knots to 15 knots and all it does is change the pitch of the propeller blades. So you still have the same RPM, so it makes it harder for a sub to tell what your speed is. Uh, if we come over here, you got the streamers, you got your tow array. This can stream out really far, I think to like 3,000 feet or something. And then the Nixie torpedo decoy, which is your only way to ward off a torpedo here. Uh, you know, it's it's decently effective. I've had it ward off a few torpedoes for me, but uh. I don't know. It's not something that just like goes out there. You have to stream it, so it's always like attached to your ship, so you can't just like run away from a countermeasure field like in the LA or something. And then coming over here, we have our our, our flare and shaft that you use to the to try and defeat um, homing missiles, homing enemy missiles. I'm not sure if I've ever seen one of these actually defeat an enemy missile. I've heard that if you can launch chaff for a radar guided for a radar guided missile, as soon as the missile tries to you know get a lock onto you, if you launch chaff. It'll, I've heard that it can uh, defeat the, the missile that way, but uh, you can just launch these bad boys out here, click them. Launching flares to starboard, sir. And then you'll get a, a nice little flare or whatever out here. So you got the flare right there and then the chaff going out. Uh, the flares for infrared, obviously, and then chaff is just a lot, bunch of metal flakes in the air to try and make a huge radar blip that's hopefully bigger than your ship. So yeah, there's the, the flare and chaff. And then coming to the right, you got your starboard winglet here. All right, we still got some time. Let's check out the, uh, they call this the machine gun here. Uh, you, you hit, this is uh, back towards the stern of the ship. Um, you can, like, look around like this. This is useful for some of those missions where you got to attack little patrol boats or fast attacks or something. And then it also has a 50 cal, which you can use to engage targets. Uh, the aiming reticule is kind of weird in this. The pitch is, like, the up and down part's kind of weird, and that it's never really, like, all in the center dot for whatever reason. I guess it's... I don't really know why, but um, it's easy enough to compensate for sometimes. But the left to right is always pretty much spot on, so there you go. Uh, this thing will take a while to reload if you have like quick reload times on. And then, of course, you have your binoculars as well with LLTV. Uh, let's see. Okay, so that's about the gist of it for that. And then the, the ES... Uh, I guess the last thing I can go over here is electronic warfare. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing, and you have an auto crew for it on here, which is nice. So you're probably going to want to use that. Because when you're playing as a Frigga, there's going to be a lot of crap going on, so Auto Crew ESM will be nice. EW, rather. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm actually going to end this video here. Because these other stations are so different, I want to devote entire videos to them. Because they are so, so just much more unique or whatever. There's a lot more going on with the parry. Um, you have to worry about both undersea and above sea threats constantly, so it's uh, definitely much more daunting. There's a lot of stuff to, to have to worry about. So, uh, yeah, make sure you tune in for the next episode. Well, we got a little bit of time here, so I'm going to go over the whole sonar as well. This is pretty easy to figure out. Um, so this is your pinging screen right here. Uh, you know, you got range scales like on the on the, on the the LA, and this has like a similar interface to the Seawolf, which I always found interesting. I don't really know why. 
these things, these ships aren't really that new. They're actually being decommissioned right now. Uh, but you got active and passive mode. Um, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen one ship on the passive hull sonar on this thing. So uh, you're never really going to be using that too much. But then active here, you got a uh, several modes: single beam, omni, omni rotational, high frequency. So high frequency is like the same on the sub. You know, you're looking for mines or icebergs or something. Or if you're really close to an enemy sub, you can turn it on. You'll actually see the sub like on the screen or whatever. Uh, single beam, uh, it's like a, it shoots a beam out at you know plus or minus 20 degrees or something. Let's see what that does. Well, here, hold on. Let me uh, go over the rest of this before I do that. All right. So as you can see here, single beam, it focuses all the available wattage that the active sonar has on the one single beam, which is the plus or minus 20 degrees or whatever. So uh, you'll get maximum detection range. And uh, so if you're pinging down that bearing, people will be able to hear you from further away. But since it's on a single beam, only people in, in that beam will be able to hear the ping. Omni just takes that same maximum energy for a single beam and transmits it over all directions. So your detection range is going to be reduced significantly. And uh, people in the surrounding area will be able to hear you um, pretty well. But Omni Rotational is a combination of single beam and Omni, it looks like here. So it looks like Omni Rotational takes a, it does single beam mode, but each time you send a ping, it does it on like each beam, so like as quickly as possible. So it'll do it at like, if you see up here in like the, uh, the degree readouts at the top of the, the thing here, you might do it at, you know, plus 130, and then switch over and do it at 90, and then do it at 40, and do it at zero but it will send the maximum power down each beam really quickly. So you'll get maximum detection range over all directions, but then you'll also be getting maximum counter detection range, so people will be able to he hear you from even further away and on all bearings. So uh, it, depending on the situation, you have to make your your best judgment as to which option is the best for you in that situation. But uh, yeah, you got those modes, so you come back here, XMIT is transmit, you click that, it sends out a ping, and then you can uh, mark or sign a, a tracker. So if you get like a, a sub out there that you find, you can put a, one of these on it. Uh, and I guess it's an active tracker or something like that. And it'll just keep automatically updating it if you turn the ping on to continuous mode so you don't have to sit here and uh, classify it all the time. So let's go back here. Um, I think in the, sub in the submarines, each time you ping it, like washes out the display and rewrites it. And here it actually overlaps. So if you, a quick way to just erase this off the screen is to just click a different range scale here. It'll wipe it clean. And uh, yeah, this goes up to 10 nautical miles here. And uh, yeah, that's that's it for the, so the whole sonar here. So yeah, I'm probably going to call this video right here. Uh, yeah, and then here you switch to continuous ping. So yeah, thanks for watching, everyone. So that's, uh, I guess that's four stations down, eight to go. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of stations going on here. There's a lot of stuff. You got sono buoys, Hilo. And then you got the tote array, which will be coming later, because I still have to figure out how that really works. Uh, yeah, EW, we went over that. Weapons coordinator and then weapons control. Those are going to be two big stations as well. And then torpedo control and TMA as well. So, yeah, we got a lot to come left on the parry here. But uh, it's uh, it can be pretty daunting, but I'm going to try and help break it down so you understand what's going on with all these stations. So, yeah, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good day.